a biomedical engineer. That means I was trained as an engineer focusing on applications in the healthcare sector. And for us biomedical engineers, the holy grail is developing technologies that will have an impact on patients' lives. As a researcher, I've been fortunate enough to be in close contact with the patients that we're working for. So I would like to start by telling the story of one of these patients. Let's call her Rose. When Rose was born, she had a curvy leg. Nothing special, a lot of babies have curvy legs. But in Rose's case, her leg kept on getting more and more curvy. And at some point, four months after she was born, it broke. She didn't fall, she didn't kick, it just snapped. And it did not heal. Months went by, nothing happened. In 95% of the cases, fractures in your bones will heal with just only a cast or a fixation, but that did not happen for Rose. And that was because she had a genetic defect in the cells at the location where her bone fractured. Those cells formed weak bone, which, was, which explained the curviness of her bone, and that genetic defect made sure that the bone could not heal properly. Now, when she was four years old, she was finally big enough to have more invasive treatment, but still nothing worked. And again, years went by. And at some point when she was nine years old, she and her parents had had enough. Without an immediate outlook on new therapies, they decided to go for an amputation. Now, many of you or all of you have known multiple people that at some point in their lives have broken a bone. Fewer of you know people where this fracture process or where this healing process did not occur smoothly. And far fewer of you, I'm sure, know of cases where a broken bone, having received the best possible medical care that we have available today, resulted in an amputation. Now, what Rose needed and what is not available today is a biological spare part. Was for the bad tissue to be removed completely and to be replaced by a living implant. Not an implant made of plastic or metal that doesn't grow as she would grow, that had to be replaced after 20 years, but an implant that would fully and functionally integrate in her body. So today I want to take you on a journey of how to make such a living implant. And I will do that by focusing on the five key words that you see behind me. And I'll start with the why. Why are we doing this? Why do we want to make these living implants? Is it just for Rose and, and the 500 other patients like her in Europe which have a similar genetic defect? Well, absolutely not. In the Western world alone, there are hundreds of thousands of patients that are waiting for a biological spare part. And a golden standard treatment nowadays is organ transplantation. And as you see, the amount of people waiting for a biological spare part is increasing every year. And even though the amount of human donors is increasing, and every donor can donate multiple organs, it's still very unlikely that we will be able to help all the patients on the waiting list. So the concept of tissue engineering was born as a part of the answer to this unmet medical need to develop these living implants. And tissue engineering is a field where we combine insights from biomedical sciences and engineering sciences to create these implants. So what is it that we want to make? What is this living implant? Well, if you want to make something and you don't really know what to make, then you look around for examples. And in our case, the example is obvious. There is a tissue engineer par excellence, and that is Mother Nature, who has had millions of years to develop living tissues. So how are we copying Mother Nature? Well, there's, or trying to copy Mother Nature. There are two ways that we can do that. Well, the first way is that we look at what our tissues and our organs look like in our bodies. And if we stay with the bone example, you see that bone tissue is a composite material. It has a mineral part, which gives bone its strength, and it has a uh, fibrous part, which gives bone its resilience. And this tissue, on the outside of our bones, is a very dense, compact tissue. But on the inside of our long bones, at the ends, you see it has a kind of um, sponge-like structure. 
And it is this combination of a sponge-like structure together with the composite material that is sought after as a biomaterial that is clinically used nowadays in orthopedics and dentistry. Unfortunately, the results with these type of materials are not exactly what we would like them to be. They're very variable. And why could that be? Well, if you think about how these tissues are formed, this structure does not happen overnight. This tissue is formed by cells that interact with their environment, with each other, to create a process, at the end of which you will get a structure like that. So another way in which we can try to copy nature is by trying to copy the process of forming a tissue, the developmental process of making such a tissue. So what does that look like for bone? It first starts with cells that are coming together and form a tight group, a condensation. And in this group, the cells will start specializing. In the case of bone, they will start turning into cells that will form cartilage. And this cartilage tissue will be like an intermediate structure, a template in which over time you will see some cells starting to mature, starting to specialize. And as the bone grows, you will see, or as the template grows, you will see that in the middle and at the ends of the bone, you'll get bone formation. Now, the two red zones that you see here are the places where this cartilage template keeps on being present. And that is what we call the growth plate. The growth plate, you all know it, it is the, the source or the, the, the motor of most of the bone formation after we're born. So, if we want to make this growth plate-like structure, how do we do that? As with any building project, the first thing you do is gather your building blocks. And the building blocks to create a living implant are your cells, growth factors, and a biomaterial. For the cells, we want to use stem cells. Stem cells are cells that you can find in all the tissues of your body and that are able or capable of specializing into many tissue-forming cells. So for the bones, we find these stem cells in the bone marrow and in the soft tissue that surrounds our bones. And we're lucky because those places are relatively easy, accessible. So we can take these cells and we can take them to the lab and we can grow them until we have enough cells to form a living implant. Now, the way we grow them, if we want to grow them in the laboratory, we need to give them incentives. We need to give them instructions of whether to multiply or to start specializing. And we do that by using growth factors or hormones. So once we have our cells in the state where we want them to be, then we have to provide some structure to form our living implant. And we can do that by biomaterials. And if we are following development, this needs to be some kind of soft hydrogel. And a hydrogel, you can think of it as a bunch of intertwined spaghettis that together can hold a huge amount of water. And these biomaterials, we can make them smart by decorating them, as we call it, with growth factors or with nutrients that will instruct the cells to keep on multiplying or start forming tissue-specific cells. Now that we have all these building blocks, how do we put them together? How do we make our living implant? Well, there's multiple manufacturing technologies that we can use, but there is one that has been receiving quite a lot of attention lately, and that is 3D bioprinting. 3D bioprinting as a process uses the same elements as normal printing. You start with a design. In our case, we want to make a growth plate. Then you have to come up with an ink. In our case, that will be a bio ink, which is a mixture of the cells and the soft hydrogel. And then you have to have your printer. And I'll give the example of what is called an extrusion bioprinter. That is a bioprinter that looks a lot like uh, a syringe, where you put your hydrogel in with your cells, and then you push, it, uh, you push the hydrogel out, and so you form layer by layer your 3D structure, your 3D living implant. Now, this technology itself is not, without, is not perfect yet. So, for instance, when we push our cells through the syringe, we're exerting a lot of mechanical forces on it. We're giving them a lot of stress. And cells, when you stress them too much, they can change, or they could even die. 
So there is still quite some development to be done in the building blocks and the manufacturing technologies. Now, if we have all of that, when can we build our living implants that we can give to our patients? Well, before looking into the future, let's first take a step back and look how, how the field has developed. 30 years after, 30 something years after it was first established, we're still describing tissue engineering as a highly innovative field. But the focus of this innovation has shifted quite a bit over time. In the very first phase of tissue engineering, it was the concept itself, the idea of creating a living implant that was the innovation. And as with any new te promising technology, there was a hype that was created, bold claims were made, and, and, and expectations were inflated. There was a lot of money that was invested in startup companies that would bring all of this to the market. But if we look back now, People back then didn't really have a very clear concept of what it was that they wanted to make as a living implant. Nor did they have access to all of the building blocks and the manufacturing technologies that I just described. So, around the year 2000, most of these startups had failed or folded, and the hype had died down. But in academia, tissue engineering was still very much alive, and it kept on developing, and it became a proper scientific discipline with its own community, its own jargon. And the focus of the innovation shifted towards the blueprint. What was this living implant that we needed to make? What was the right blueprint to follow? Now, the quality of the science increased, but what people were not paying a lot of attention to was the fact that once we would be able to make such a living implant, we had to not do this once in the lab, but we had to do this for many patients at a large scale. And so that meant that we had to think about how to produce it, which we hadn't done until now. So that's where we are now in the third phase, where we are reiterating these scientific developments, but with a process engineering mindset. So who were actually these innovation drivers? So in the very first phase, it was the disciplines, so the different disciplines. If you had the biomaterial people that had, come up, that had come up with a brand new biomaterial, well, that would be used. Not, no questions asked whether that would be the best biomaterial, but that was the thing that would be used. In the second phase, you had the first real tissue engineers appearing that were able to cross the, the, the lines between these disciplines and bring all of these building blocks together in a living implant. Now, at that stage, people were not really thinking about the patient. The patient was almost like an afterthought, which of course is not what it should be. So now in the third phase, we are reversing these innovation drivers. We are starting from the patient. We're identifying what are the needs of this patient and what does that mean in terms of the requirements for our living implants, bearing in mind that at some point we'll have to produce this. And then these requirements for the living implant will then translate into innovations that are needed in terms of biological building blocks, manufacturing technologies, and quality control tools. The innovation is not only at this stage in the R&D process. The innovation is also in the business model that we will have to use. Because if you think about living implants, they're very complex and they're very personalized, much more so than typical pharmaceuticals. And if you combine that with the low volume in which they will have to be produced and the complex regulatory landscape, so the complex ways in which you can get approval to use them in patients, that makes for a very tricky business case. So classic pharma models cannot apply. And we'll have to think about other ways to do that. And one of the concepts that will be important, for instance, is design to cost. That means that from the very beginning of your R&D process, you have to take along the manufacturing cost as an independent design variable. So that once you are making your implant, you're sure that you can offer it at an affordable cost. Now, once we have all that, will we then be able to help the patient and close this cycle? So we started by identifying the unmet medical need. We said we were going to address it by making a living implant for which we would take inspiration from the quintessential tissue engineer that is modern nature, bearing in mind that we had to produce this for the patient. 
And so when we do all that, then we can address the need of the patient. So by closing this cycle, we are guaranteeing that we will be able to design, develop, and deliver functional or living implants, biological spare parts that will fully and functionally integrate and replace the missing or the absent tissues and organs in our body for Rose and for all the other patients out there. Thank you. <laughs>